3. It's those lesser things that cause so much trouble. We're going to see a group of people working here together today, and uh, there were lesser things we're going to see in this passage that could have defeated the whole project, but somehow they were able to rise above them. You know, there's nothing like an important project to supersede everything else to help us to forget those lesser things. I often think of MDS you know, when there's a major disaster, somehow our Anabaptist people of all stripes can get together and can get along really well for one week <laughs> because they're focused on one, one project. Now, I'm not saying there aren't issues there that need to be resolved. I'm just simply saying there's nothing like a project to get us to lay down at least for a week uh, our lesser things. So, we're here in uh, Nehemiah. Now, Many commentators skip this part of Nehemiah because it's a little bit like reading 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 3. A lot of hard names, a lot of just a list of things. And uh, I struggled, I almost skipped it too for that reason. But I'm going to give a little bit of credit this morning. I don't often draw as heavily as I did this time from Warren Wiersbe. Uh, I tried so hard to get my own outline and every time I kept coming back to his because he nailed it so well. So... I'm going to give public credit to Warren Wiersbe this morning. Uh, actually, it was interesting. I went online and found a good sermon. I thought, now this is really a good sermon. And then when I picked up Warren Wiersbe, I found out he had copied Warren Wiersbe. <laughs> so uh, he did an excellent job. So if you have his commentary, you'll, you'll see some of these thoughts there. Okay. This chapter <clears throat> is just simply moving on with God's plan for his people. I went back to Jeremiah 29... 11, and it says there, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I really like that verse. We often quote that last part, uh, but we forget that that was spoken to the children of Israel just as they were going into captivity. Now, this work of the Lord was not done in one miraculous action. It was a process that included some very interesting people. In the first place, it included Jeremiah's prophecy, which I just read. Then in Daniel 9, we have Daniel's prayers in relation to that prophecy. Then we have a heathen king, Cyrus, that several hundred years beforehand had been prophesied that he would set in motion this return to the land. Then we have <clears throat> uh, three returns. Uh, and I'll just review them. We've looked at these before, but I'll just review them. The first one, of course, was under Zerubbabel in 536. Uh, now, <clears throat> it's interesting. They went into captivity in 586. And this is all B.C., and if you notice, this is 50 years. And uh, they got discouraged building the temple because they were, had so much uh, opposition. Uh, the people of the land, of course, didn't want to see this happen. And so they wrote back to the king and said, you'll find this a rebellious city. You better deal with these people and so on. And uh, they had sort of quit building. And then they had two people come along, Zerubbabel and Jeshua in uh, and they talked to the people, and they said, look, uh, the, the 70 years is not necessarily saying that's when you're going to return. And so the temple was actually finished in 516, which gives the 70 years. So you have Zerubbabel, and you have Jeshua in there. Uh, with their very important, I, I was just thinking this morning of all the people that got involved in the fulfillment of this prophecy, which all reminded me that God's plans are long plans, and we need to fulfill our part, or that plan, uh, somebody else, of course, he'll have to fulfill it. But uh, he uses many different people. Then in 456, 80 years later, you have Ezra returning 
the temple's built, and the people are in horrible spiritual shape. And this Ezra was an interesting man. He was a priest and a scribe. He is credited for canonizing, or at least being involved with the canonization of the Old Testament. He's credited also with beginning the synagogue, which brought these people back to an intense study of the Bible, uh, of their Torah. Uh, he, was, he was a rather remarkable person. Of course, in this case, he helped with Nehemiah to bring a real spiritual revival. And then finally, in 444 B.C., we have Nehemiah returning and working with Ezra and building the wall. All right. This was a great task that required great faith. Jerusalem was without social, economic, or spiritual structure or stability. I mean, it was completely damaged. The walls, the people, uh, the customs, the laws, everything was just completely in disarray. Socially, they were in distress by continual oppression by their foreign neighbors. Economically, they were in, in, in distress because of the unbearable burdens placed upon them by the Persians, and we'll get to that in this book. Spiritually, they were in bad trouble because they, had, they never had really fully separated themselves from the people of the land. And uh, I'll just go back and reread uh, the challenges that Nehemiah faced. I had written them in uh, the last message. He had a temperamental king to deal with before he could even get started with his project. He had Jerusalem surrounded by enemies. He had a discouraged remnant in the city. And he had Jewish traitors that were working with the opposition outside the city. I, I mean, I read this and I say to myself, Nehemiah, why? You had a cushy job as cupbearer to the king. You had it made. It was secure. It was probably all the perks. Why in the world did you leave that and go back to all of this with no promise of, of success except what you believed about God? Everything looked negative and everything looked difficult and actually look risky. All right, so <clears throat> that's what we have with Nehemiah uh, going back to this land. <clears throat> now, Nehemiah was a true, true leader. He was a man of vision. He was a man of faith. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of action. He was a man of confession. He was, he was just a, a, an outstanding person. He was a true leader. It was a person that you held confidence in that you could follow because of what I just told you. Now, in Nehemiah 3, the vision now begins to take shape, the building of this wall. <clears throat> There's some very practical truths in this chapter, and that's why I decided not to neglect it after, like I said, Warren Worsby helped me see some of these that I probably would have overlooked. So I want to use uh, his outline, and it, it's three words. It's the purpose... the people, and the places, those three things. So let's talk first of all about the purpose. Nehemiah's name is not mentioned in this chapter. I think one of the reasons is he did not want to call attention to himself. He really did believe this was a work for the glory of God. It was a spiritual work. And what was his great passion well, if you look through this book a number of times, he talks about this reproach that these people were under. And he understood that if God's people are under reproach, then God is under reproach. And that was an unbearable thought to him, that there would be a reproach brought against God by the way his people were experiencing things. Jerusalem was to be beautiful. It was to be beautiful for situation. It was to be the joy of the whole earth. God's purpose was to have this nation show all the other nations what a nation looked like whose God is the Lord. And people were to look and say, what a great nation. Lord, a beautiful people. I wish we could be like that. Let's learn from them. But that wasn't happening. They were under reproach. So, <clears throat> you know, to me that's... When I thought about that, I almost sat at my desk and cried. That's what the church is to be. The church is to be something that everybody's looking on and they're saying, wow. In fact, when I describe what Jesus said, that, or what the, uh, Jesus talked about in relation to the church, especially in Matthew 5, an equitable society, 
It's very frequently that someone who's talking to me from one of the billboards, after I get finished with that, there'll be a pause, and then they'll say, wow. Do you think that people say wow when they hear about Chippensburg Christian Fellowship? I'm, I hope so. <laughs> but that's what I want to inspire you with. That's what the church is to be. It is to be a beautiful place for situation, the joy of the whole earth. And it's the one thing the devil doesn't want ever to happen. It was said that God loved the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. You know, Lynn used to say, beware how you treat the church. It's the apple of God's eye. This is the crowning work of God, the church. And I think people are pretty careless. In fact, in the past, I'm sure I have been careless. We should see this as a gem that we're here to polish and enhance and beautify in every way we can, and every little lesser thing we have must be put aside to give this great glory to God's church. That's the thing I'd like to challenge us with this morning. How motivated are we to remove the reproach? I want you to read with me Hebrews chapter 12. I think Wesley will get there eventually, uh, but it's going to be a while. So turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to see what God says about the church. Now, I told you what he wanted in the Old Testament, and it says in verse 18 here, it says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of the trumpet. You're not come to something like that. What are we come to? Verse 22. But ye are come to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that sprinketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. That is a beautiful, exalted picture, Brother Harvey, of what the church was intended to be. And I hope every person this morning takes from this little message a determination that above everything else, you're going to work for that here at Shippensburg. That's, what you're, that's your vision for Shippensburg Christian Fellowship. That if some lesser thing comes along, you're not going to let it distract us. Here people marginalize their differences to focus on building something. To restore the city of Jerusalem to the glory that God intended for it. Neither surrounding enemies nor internal differences and difficulties distracted these people. They worked. And we're going to see there were some distractions and there were some difficulties right in this chapter. Nothing is said about new material. Now, he had ordered some new material, uh, I think, for some building. I'm not quite sure where that building was to take place, but he'd had the king requisition from the king's forest. But what, what we read in this chapter, there was just enough in the rubble there. It just had to be reassembled. It had been torn down. And they just they took this rubble and, and took the good part out of it and, re, and built this wall. And that said something to me, too. If we want to build a, a beautiful edifice for God, I'm not sure how much new material we need. This has been alluded to this morning. You know, out there are people who think they're going to reinvent something, and they're trying out all kinds of new ideas to see if they can't just get a better result and a more beautiful picture of the church, and they run off in all directions with all kinds of newfangled gimmicks and ideas. Uh-uh. <laughs> My experience is, if you come to hear Brother Edsel, the issues that we face today are the very same issues that the early church faced, and as he will be speaking, that the Anabaptists faced. Same questions, same issues, same people, same problems. And they had answers. And those answers are historic answers. They go the whole way through churches. Wherever you find a faithful group of people, you'll find them applying those very same things and those very same answers to the very same questions. And so we just need to <laughs> dig in the rubble of history and find out what I call the historic Christian faith. Now, I know Chambersburg Christian Fellowship makes a big thing of this, and it is important. When somebody comes to me with some new idea or some new method or something, I immediately say to myself, where is this in church history? If it's not in church history, I'm not interested in it. Because there will be nothing new. We go back to the rubble and get away the, the, the 
distractions and find out the truth from the past. Reproach is not removed by inventing something new. Everything we needed can be found in the work of the past. All right? So that's the purpose. The purpose is to remove the reproach and to bring this body of Christ to its full potential. You know, Ephesians says, this is God's inheritance. We're always talking about our inheritance, but in Ephesians, it talks about God's inheritance. And you know if you inherit something, you say, now wait a minute, what are the possibilities? Ah, I think we can grow uh, something here, and I think we should put a building here. And we see that You look at all the possibilities, and whoever owns that property, they just keep working and working and working to fulfill all those, that potential. That's what God's doing. He looks at Shippensburg Christian Fellowship, and he sees all the potential. He knows exactly where the potential is. And he wants to work that potential to bring this to a glorious body. I want to commit myself anew this morning to be part of that. All right? So that's the purpose. All right, secondly, let's talk about the people. Here again, <laughs> we're going to find familiar characteristics. People have not changed. You know, people talk to me on the phone and they say, well, well, you, you're following that old book and, and all that. You know, times have changed and people have changed their ideas and all. And I say, wait a minute. <laughs> people have not changed. God has not changed. Sin has not changed. Nothing essential has changed. And we see that here. Now, what do we see? In verse 1, we see that the spiritual leaders stepped up first. And I think that's very important. I think it's very important that spiritual leaders are people of vision and courage, and they take the first steps, and they lead the people uh, to something. Let's read this, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it, set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mira. They sanctified it unto the tower of Han Han Hananiel. And next unto them built the sun. Okay, anyway, so the priest began, the high priest... Now, these are the people that you picture in the Old Testament wearing a garb of blue and purple and scarlet with a golden mitre, uh, uh, diadem on their head with holiness unto the Lord and a breastplate with the stones representing the children of Israel. I mean, these were, these were majestic-looking people, these priests. Here they are, digging around in the rubble and laying stones and working with their hands and leading out in this very mundane project. Because this was important what they did. They built the sheep gate. That's the gate on the northern part of the city where the, temp the temple was in the northern part of the city and that's where the sheep were brought in for sacrifice. It's a symbol of the cross. And that got established first. The sheep gate, the symbol of the cross, the success for this entire city symbolized in that gate. Now, I said there would be imperfections in this. Elisha set a grand, wonderful example here, but here's a, here's a real caution. We're going to find out later in chapter 13 that Elisha, Eli, Elisha eventually defected and made common cause with the enemy. How sad. I said I could have sat at my desk and cried. Here's a man that made such a good start, and I've thought of all the people who make a wonderful start. They lead out. They say, come, let's go, and people start to follow. But it's not the beginning, folks. It's the end. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon, and you have to finish well. But Elisha led out, Elisha led out well, okay? So the first thing we see here is the spiritual leaders were the people who led out in this, and they consecrated that gate. That's the only gate, by the way, that was consecrated, which I think consecrated the whole project uh, because of that consecration. And so we, you, we have spiritual leaders. I think it could be said that no, per, no group of people has ever risen above their leadership. I think that could be said. This is very important, okay? The second thing we see here, God uses all kinds of people. You have rulers. Look at verse 9. You have the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. He was a very, very powerful political figure. He's out there digging through the rubble and laying stones. You have priests, which we've already mentioned. You have women. Look at verse 8. 
you have, um, well, I thought it was in verse 8. 12, is it in 12? He and his daughters, yes, yes, the girls were involved. You have craftsmen. You have the apothecary, the people that mix medicine and perfumes and so on. That's their, but they're out there digging through the rubble and laying, laying uh, uh, stones. You have uh, goldsmiths. I mean, you can go down through this and you can see a wide variety of people. Uh, from the very professional craftsmen and leaders and rulers and priests down to just the ordinary people. Uh, all working together. There was a job for everyone. 18 times in this passage... It says next to them, or after them. They were all working together, connecting this wall. <clears throat> the third thing we learn is that some people will not work. But you can build a wall if some people don't work. Now, I mean, that's sad. I pity them. They're missing the blessing, of course. But look at verse 5. And next to them, the Decoites repaired but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. They say this is a term related to animals. So they were a stiff-necked bunch. We're nobles. We're not going to bow our neck to that kind of labor. We're not going to submit. We're not going to help. They were too proud. The wall got built. <laughs> the thing I see here is it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. We should be working toward that. And I guess they should have gone and worked a little on those people to get them to work. But anyway, the wall got built, but you had people who would not help. Okay? Jeremiah 48.10 is an interesting verse you might look up sometime. It's a curse upon people who will not do their part. Think about that. If you have a talent, or you have something you're supposed to contribute, and you're part of this potential God wants to realize, and you just don't do it. It's not me that said it. It's God that says it in Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 10. Cursed are people who will not put their shoulder to the work. Jesus did. He was a carpenter. Paul did. He was a tent maker. The Tekoites, by the way, that helped with this wall weren't even from the city. They were from Teco, which was about 11 miles away. They'd have been much safer to stay at home. The danger was in that city. Now, in fact, I think there were a number of people uh, that were from Gibeon, from Mizpah. These were, these were outside the city. They had no uh, particular personal interest in that city except the glory of God. And so they came and got involved, all right? Their loyalty to God was greater than their local interests, and they would have been safer at home, but they risked their lives because they wanted to help remove the reproach and restore the glory of God. The fourth thing we see, some do more work than others. And you find this in six different places where it says this, the, this person built another part of the wall. So they got their own work done and then they went and helped and did more. One man actually built his own wall and then he helped to build the wall in front of the dwelling of the priest. And so there were some people like that. You know, some people when they get their job done, they say, well, I've done my job. These people didn't. <laughs> These people said, look, I have my part of the wall finished. Anything more for me to do? And they took up another task. Don't stop after your task is finished. Ask for more uh, assignments. The fifth thing we notice is some work with passion. Notice verse 20. It says, these people worked earnestly. So if you'd have looked at this work, you'd have seen that everybody was working hard. I believe they're all working hard. But if you'd have looked at this, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, Baruch. If you'd have looked at Baruch, <laughs> there was zeal there. He was putting more into the work than what ordinarily was put into the work. He was doing his work earnestly. Uh, he wasn't just serving, but he was zealous. That word zealous, by the way, means to be on fire. Do people know you as a person who is on fire for the Lord's work? I mean, there's fire there. <laughs> there's energy. There's a glow in the life. It's not just, you know, well, let's get this wall built. And I'll work hard, but th this person, the look on his face, the spring in his step, the attitude that he expressed, 
was that he was putting his whole self into this work. I love that. Of course, you know I love that word, passion. <laughs> In fact, that's what I look for. If somebody says he's a Christian, I'm looking for, I can't make a judgment. That's God's to make. But I can, I can look to see if there's any evidence of that profession. I'm looking for passion. And you know, the Old Testament Jews had figured this out. They'd figured that the person who was a true Jew had zeal. That's why Paul said, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. I proved to you that I, I'm a true Jew. That's another way of saying passion. So you have those people. You have those people in the church that do an extra job. You have those people in the church that are doing it with a glow and with a passion and with a fire in their bosom. And uh, they're just pouring themselves out with their zeal. And then finally, some do their work at home. In, a, in a four or five places here, you find it says uh, it's six different workers and an unknown number of priests, it says they repaired the portions of the wall nearest to their own house. Christian service begins at home. That is where probably we should be concentrating our most effort. But then we should have plenty of effort left over for, for outside of our home. But I really think that's where it belongs. So there's a Chinese proverb that says, better to be kind at home than to burn incense at a far place. And 1 Timothy 5.4 says, let them learn to show piety at home. And I think that ties right into our Sunday school lesson. Uh, if that is really true, there's a strong connection between the generations. So there we are. Let me review it. The spiritual leaders step up first. God uses all kinds of people. Some people will not work, but the job will still get done. Sorry for them. Some do more work than others. Some work with passion, and some concentrate their efforts closest home. So those are the people. That's an interesting uh, discussion. Now let's talk a little bit about the places. Now, when I first started studying this, I picked up somebody else who the, his treatment of the, this chapter was to show that this, this chapter shows the whole story of the gospel. And I thought, well, that's a little too metaphorical for me. I, I don't, don't know if I want to take that route here. <laughs> because you can do all kinds of things once you start down that route. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, I don't want to make that my major message here, and I'm not sure that's the major message. I think the major message here is people work zealously and work together to remove the reproach. But I think these gates do give us, if you go counterclockwise around the city, I wish I could have put a map up here and showed you these 10 gates we're going to talk about. It's counterclockwise around the city. It starts with the sheep gate and it ends with the sheep gate. And it does give a, an interesting picture of the gospel. I don't know if that was intentional or not. I'd like to think that the Bible is written with a plan in mind, and it could be that this was uh, a God's purpose. We already talked about the sheep gate. It begins and ends with the Lamb of God, the sheep, okay, the Alpha and Omega. And it's interesting, this gate has no locks or no bars. You'll notice all the gates talk about locks and bars. This one has no locks or bars. I'll let you make the application. That gate is always open. That gate is always open. So that's a sheep gate. It starts at the cross. It starts at a full surrender to Christ. It starts at a death to self. It starts with a full commitment to let God speak to me and to fully and wholeheartedly, to the best of my ability, obey. Okay? The second thing we have is the fish gate in chapter 3. This is where the fish were brought into the city. And you would have had no trouble finding that gate. I think you could just follow your nose and you'd have gotten to the fish gate. But anyway, this was the fish gate. What did Jesus say? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I think the first thing that happens when a person is newly converted and really experiences the fullness of that cleansing experience and freedom experience from all the past, he wants to tell others. I remember when it first happened to me, and I hate to give too many personal illustrations, but I went to the bookstore and bought me a great big pack of tracks and ended up on the streets of Chambersburg every Friday night. Now, that's when there were shoppers in Chambersburg and passed out tracts. Now, I knew that much about the gospel. I didn't have much to share. But I remember my passion to tell the whole world what I had found. 
And that's what you find next to the temple gate, or the uh, sheep gate, you find this fish gate, for whatever it's worth. The third thing you find is the old gate. That's in verse 6. This led to the northwest section of the city, the new quarter. All right, that's interesting to me. The old gate led to the new section of the city. Jeremiah 6.16 says, As for the old paths, where is a, wait, I'm sorry, where is a good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. This goes back to what I said earlier. Look for the old paths. That's what I'm always looking for. What was the secret of the Waldensians? What was the secret of the Anabaptists? What was the secret of the early church that conquered the Roman Empire's heart within 200 years? What was the secret of the Moravians? What was the secret even of the Wesleys? And what was the secret of the Church of the Brethren? Places where there was real What's the secret? What did they believe? What did they practice? If we abandon the old, there will be nothing new. Winston Churchill said that. He says, if you open up a, a controversy with the past, you will find you, lost, you have lost the future. I like that. If you open up a controversy with the past, you will find that you have lost the future. And so, the next thing a person's concerned about is to find the old paths. Matthew 13, 52 says, Every scribe is, in, scribe is instructed in the kingdom of heaven and brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. I'm going to put in a little plug for Edsel's lectures. I really think you should hear them. I really think we should take every opportunity we have to learn the old paths. What happened in the past? There's an awful lot we can learn about historic Christianity. The fourth thing is the valley gate. That's in verse 13. I think that pictures humility. And God gives grace to the humble. So I think that's what that valley gate tells us. Uh, we need to be humble enough to take the old path. All right? Then we have the dung gate. That's in verse 14 of this chapter. Now that's the gate that exited into the valley of Hinnom where Gehenna was. Where there was this fire burning all the time and they brought all their garbage there and it stunk and it was an ugly place. You did, you, when you went out that gate, I think you walked pretty fast past that section of the city. What does that suggest to you? Getting rid of all the garbage in our lives. That's what it suggests to me. And then next we have the fountain gate. This was the gate that led to the Pool of Siloam, which was fed by the spring outside the city that flowed through Hezekiah's tunnel into that pool. That suggests to me the Spirit of God, the fountain gate. Now notice where we have moved here in these last couple gates. We've moved from humility to cleansing and to the fullness of the Spirit. I think that's an interesting progression. The next thing we find here is the water gate. Verse 26. This is the gate where Ezra stood to read the word of God and brought a great revival to the nation. So this water gate to me stands for the word of God. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. I have people calling me all the time on our billboard that says, shackled by lust. How do you get free? I said, well, a tremendous thing a tremendous help to me when I was a young boy especially, and I, I've picked it up again recently, and it's such a blessing, is memorizing Scripture. Just fill your mind with Scripture. It's a tremendous detergent. Now you're clean through the Word. It washes out the gunk. Psalmist says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy Word. There's nothing more pure, there's nothing more cleansing then these words, these very words, these are not the words of men. These are the words of God. And uh, it's amazing to me. I mean, I'll just give a little testimony here. I, I got back into scripture memory. I laid it aside for, I, I just didn't apply myself. It's amazing what happens to a scripture when you memorize it. 
I've been talking about Psalm 101. I finally have it completely memorized. And that thing is just full of all kinds of gems that I've missed all the years I just read over it. So I just really want to put in a plug here. Fill your mind with scripture. Start with Psalm 1. It's an easy psalm to memorize. And then just keep working. You don't don't have to work on more than a verse a day or even a half a verse or a verse a week. At least that's more than, than what many people do. The water gate. The cleansing of the word. Next, we have the horse gate. This is where Athaliah, that wicked queen, was slain. If you go back to 2 Chronicles 23, 15, you will find it says she was slain at the horse gate. To me, horses picture conflict. They picture war. They picture victory. They picture uh, conquest over evil. It was interesting that the priests also repaired this gate. They repaired the sheep gate, but they also repaired this horse gate, for whatever that's worth, okay? Then we have the east gate. This gate led directly to the golden gate, which was the gate of the temple. Tradition says that Jesus entered this gate on Palm Sunday, and many Christians believe that that's where he will enter, uh, and this depends on your eschatology, so I'm not pushing this. Uh, that that's where he will enter when he returns. So we'll just, you take that and do with it what you want to do with it, okay? So that's the East Gate, where the Messiah came on Palm Sunday, and then you can believe about the future what you want to believe, okay? And finally, we have the Inspection Gate. It has a big name there, but it means inspection. This is where the king reviewed his armies and registered his soldiers. That reminds me of the tremendous review that we shall all receive at the end, the judgment. I just, th- I just found it tremendously inspirational just to consider those few thoughts about these gates. But it took working together to build this wall and to restore the gates and the, remove the reproach and begin to bring forth the glory of God. And the purpose of my message this morning was a call to Shippensburg Christian Fellowship to take this attitude toward what we do here at Shippensburg. It required the work of everybody, the leadership of Nehemiah, the cooperation of the people. And only when we study, and that will not happen automatically, by the way, because there are lesser things that are going to come up, and we're going, to say, we're going to have to deliberately say no to those lesser things, whether it's a lesser uh, time we spend at something, or whether it's a lesser attitude that we have, whatever, something, a lesser thing, that diminishes the glory of the Lord that people should be seeing at Shippensburg. I conclude with the example from the geese. We all know they fly in a V formation. And by doing so, they create an upward air current for the one behind them. And they take turns flying in front, because that's the hard one. There's nobody there to to give them extra air pressure. So they say, and I never did this, if you watch that formation, that leader will will eventually come back and somebody else will take the lead because all of them behind get a lift from the one in front. And because of that, they can fly 71% further than they could fly by themselves. If someone is, if one of those geese becomes sick, it goes down to the ground and two geese follow it and stay with it and nurture it and help it until it's ready to go back into the sky. The geese in the rear are the ones you hear honking. I thought they all honked, but they say it's those ones in the rear. I don't know what they're trying to accomplish, but I'd like to think they're trying to say, hey, let's... (laughs) They're cheering everybody on and encouraging. (laughs) Everything's okay, folks. Let's keep moving. They encourage. Now, if we are Christians, if we are Christians, what I described here is our natural instinct I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 3. And I want to look at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. People are always saying, well, how can I be sure I'm a Christian? Well, there it is. Do you have this kind of love in your heart to build together with your brother, to put aside the lesser things in your life, to forgive where there's wrong, whatever it takes, to reach out 
in warmth and acceptance and blessing and benediction for your brother. And if we do, we will build together. And someday, or let's say more and more, hopefully, the world will say, that fellowship at Shippensburg is unique. When I meet any of them, they speak well of each other. They love each other. They work together. They have a reputation in this community for living a Christ-like life, both individually and together. You know, the, the, the enemy of all of this is individualism. And we live in a, an age where that's the thing. Do your own thing. And nobody's supposed to tell me what to do. And I'm not going to conform to anything. I'm going to do my... No, 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 no. The Bible says the evidence you've passed from life unto death, uh, from death unto life, is that it's your brother. It's your brother where your focus is and an outpouring of your love and help and blessing to your brother. Are there any comments on the message?